Good evening and welcome to the April Lowell First Friday Lecture. For those of you who were kind enough to fill out a survey when you um, checked in, thank you very much. We really appreciate your feedback. If you got a survey but haven't had a chance to complete it, we would love to hear your opinions. So um, you can give it to me at the end of the program if that works for you. This lecture is made possible by the generous support of the Lowell Institute, which also provides funding so that this and many other lectures may be seen on the web via the WGBH Forum Network. The address for that network and for the Museum of Science, as well as the summaries of tonight's program, may be found on the red sheets that you picked up on your way in. A couple of housekeeping things. Tonight's program should last approximately one hour, and there will be some time for questions and answers at the end. Um, please silence all pagers and cell phones. And if you do need to leave during the program, we'd ask that you use this front door. But please note that there is no reentry once the program is in progress. There will be a book signing after the um, talk just outside of the theater, so we hope you can stop by for that. And tonight we celebrate April Fool's Day with a look at the hilariously funny and thought-provoking Ig Nobel Prizes. The Igs are awarded annually at a ceremony at Harvard University and honor the more unusual side of silent science. <laughs> We are very pleased to have with us tonight Mark Abrams, who is editor of the Annals of Improbable Research and also the founder of the Ig Nobel Prizes. So please help me welcome Mark Abrams. Thank you, Monica. Thank you all for coming. Can everybody hear me? Okay, and is there anyone here who can't hear me? Just let me know if you can't. And, um, going to, what I'm going to talk about here mostly is the Ig Nobel Prizes. If you have some pressing questions, sing them out, but I'll be taking questions at the end, so you might want to save them up. This is the logo for the Ig Nobel Prizes. It speaks for itself, I suppose. And the prizes are given every year. They're given for one thing, this one simple criterion that you see. Ig Nobel Prizes go for things that first make people laugh and then make them think. And that's it. Makes people laugh, then makes them think. What people think, that's up to them. <laughs> now, this is what you win if you win an Ig Nobel Prize. These are handmade every year. It's a different design. And what's common across all of the years, across all of the designs, is that they're made from extremely cheap materials. <laughs> now, they happen to be made by a master craftsman who works here in the Museum of Science in Boston. I think he's in the room with us tonight. Eric Workman, are you here tonight? Could you stand up? In the back there, Eric. Let me tell you just a little tiny bit of background about the Ig Nobel Prizes. It's not easy to win an Ig Nobel Prize. We give 10 of them a year. We've been doing it every year since 1991. We just had the 14th first annual Ig Nobel Prize ceremony. Every year, we get more than 5,000 nominations for Ig Nobel Prizes. And from those 5,000, we have to reduce it to 10. That's not an easy task. And it's really harder than that, because whatever doesn't get chosen one year, if it's still of Ig Nobel quality, goes back into the pool. So by now, our pool is enormous. You also should know that if you're selected to win an Ig Nobel Prize, in most cases, we get in touch with you quietly beforehand, and we give you an opportunity to decline the honor if you <laughs> would like to. But very few people have ever turned down an Ig Nobel Prize. Now, if you win the prize, you get this. And you also get this. It's a certificate. It's a piece of paper which says that you've won an Ig Nobel Prize. And this piece of paper is signed by several Nobel Prize winners. It's a nice little thing to have. And you get one other thing, which is an invitation to come to the Ig Nobel Prize ceremony, which is held in this building. This is Sanders Theater on the campus of Harvard University. It's the oldest and largest and most dignified meeting place at Harvard, except on the night when we get hold of it. And you have to come at your own expense, but most of the winners do. In recent years, we've had almost all of the winners join us every year. 
And when they get there, they find that the building is filled. It uh, holds 1,200 people. And they come from around the world to, to join us. It's televised live on the Internet. You can watch it. You can go to our website and see video of previous ceremonies, if you like. And up on the stage, waiting to hand the Ig Nobel Prizes to the Ig Nobel Prize winners are some Nobel laureates. And that's the heart of the Ig Nobel ceremony. Every time we announce the winner, the winner comes from one side of the stage, a Nobel laureate comes from the other, and they meet in the middle. And it's as if at that moment the universe has two opposite ends. And you're watching these two opposite ends of the universe meet and look at each other. Neither one can quite believe it. And we have lots of other things that we jam into the ceremony as well. And we have a problem because we have so many people that ought to be allowed to say something uh, and, and so many guests coming in to honor them that we have what's known as the uh, Academy Awards problem, which is that everybody who gets to talk, of course, wants to say a little bit more than maybe they should. And if we allowed that to happen, the evening would stretch and stretch and stretch. The first few years it did stretch and stretch, and then we finally solved it. We came up with a technical solution to that problem. And this is it. We call our technical solution Miss Sweetie Pooh. This is Miss Sweetie Pooh. She's an extremely cute eight-year-old girl. She sits up on the stage during the entire ceremony. I introduce Miss Sweetie Pooh at the beginning. And I explain that whenever Miss Sweetie Pooh feels that somebody has talked long enough, she will let them know. And I ask her to demonstrate. <laughs> Miss Sweetie Pooh walks all the way across the stage, right up to the person who's at the microphone. She looks up at that person and she says, please stop, I'm bored. Please stop, I'm bored. Please stop, I'm bored. Please stop. I'm bored. And she doesn't stop until they do. <laughs> She's very effective. The first year that we had Miss Sweetie Pooh as part of the Ig Nobel ceremony, that first year, the ceremony was one hour shorter than it had been the year before. <laughs> and every year that we've had Miss Sweetie Pooh, we've managed to finish on time. We've had to go through several Miss Sweetie Poos because they grow up, and we are forever grooming a whole train of Miss Sweetie Poos for the future. Here is Miss Sweetie Poo in action, just to give you an idea. <laughs> this was an Ig Nobel Prize winner in the year 2002, I believe. This is Charles Paxton, who was a co-winner of the Ig Nobel Biology Prize, and after he reached the 62nd mark, Miss Sweetie Poo let him know. He and his colleagues, it's a team from England, four of them, they were honored for a research study that they published. The title of that was Courtship Behavior of Ostriches Towards Humans Under Farming Conditions in Britain. <laughs> now here are the winners of the most recent crop of Ig Nobel Prizes. The Ig Nobel Medicine Prize was awarded to Stephen Stack of Wayne State University and Jim Gundlach of Auburn University for their published report, The Effect of Country Music <laughs> on Suicide. This is the beginning of their published report. Now, with all of these that are published reports, I should mention you can go to your library and request that the librarian get you a copy. It usually will really make your librarian's day to hear that request, especially if you do it in a loud voice. Again, this is the beginning of the paper that won the uh, Medicine Prize. Here is one of the co-authors. This is Jim Gundlach, who came all the way from Alabama to deliver his 60-second speech. Seated behind him is a previous winner. Winners have a standing invitation to come back and take a bow, and the audience is always delighted to see them. The man in the suit sitting down there is John Trinkus. He was the winner of the previous year's Ig Nobel Literature Prize. He is a professor emeritus at a business school in New York City. He won the Literature Prize because he published more than 90, that's more than nine zero, academic papers on topics that describe things that annoyed him. <laughs> the Ig Nobel Physics Prize was awarded to Ramesh Balasubramaniam of the University of Ottawa and Michael Turvey of the University of Connecticut for exploring and explaining the dynamics of hula hooping. <laughs> this is the beginning of their published report. 
And here are the two co-winners at the Ig Nobel ceremony. Here is a technical drawing from their report. And here's a bit more detail. As soon as they finished their one-minute acceptance speech, we had a demonstration. We had a master hula hooper demonstrate what's involved in this. And the moment he finished, we had several Nobel laureates attempt to demonstrate on their own. The Ig Nobel Public Health Prize was awarded to Jillian Clark, who, when she did her work, was a 17-year-old high school student in Chicago. She's now a college freshman at Howard University in Washington. She won the Ig Nobel Prize for investigating the scientific validity of the five-second rule. The five-second rule says that it's okay, it's safe to eat food you've dropped on the floor as long as it's been there less than five seconds. This is Jillian Clark at the Ig Nobel ceremony accepting her prize. She did indeed do the world's first truly scientific test of whether the rule is valid. Anybody curious about what she found? <laughs> well, she was testing the validity of the five-second rule, and what she found was it depends. <laughs> she also did a second piece of research, which, uh, which was related. After she had done her testing um, of bacterial counts in the food and on the floor, she then went and surveyed members of the public about their involvement with the five-second rule. And what she discovered was that far more women than men will habitually pick up food off the floor and eat it. <laughs> the Ig Nobel Chemistry Prize was awarded to the Coca-Cola Company of Great Britain for using advanced technology to convert ordinary tap water into <laughs> Dasani, a transparent form of water which for precautionary reasons has been made unavailable to consumers. That last phrase, by the way, we took direct from the Coca-Cola Company's website. <laughs> and I'm sure you're all familiar with this story. If not, you can ask a little bit at the end when we take questions. Here is the substance. The Ig Nobel Engineering Prize this year was awarded to Donald Smith and the late Frank Smith, his father of Orlando, Florida, for patenting the comb-over. This is the beginning of the patent for the comb over. If you go to the US Patent Office's website, you can see the entire patent. This is the senior author. This photo was taken about 35 years ago, and here is the junior author at that time. And this next photo shows the son of this author and grandson of the other at the Ig Nobel ceremony collecting his Ig Nobel Prize. The man in the white coat there presenting the prize to him is William Lipscomb, a chemistry professor at Harvard, chemistry professor emeritus. Professor Lipscomb won the 1976 Nobel Chemistry Prize. Here is a technical drawing from the patent, and here are several other technical drawings. I'm sure somebody will ask later, so I'll save you the time. Uh, the question always comes up, do they charge you if you uh, do your own comb over? And the answer is no. They have announced publicly that they have never charged anybody for using their patent, and they never will. <laughs> the Ig Nobel Literature Prize was awarded to the American Nudist Research Library of Kissimmee, Florida, for preserving nudist history so the rest of us <laughs> can see it. This is the American Nudist Research Library. Kissimmee is located very near the city of Orlando. Next time you go to Disney World, you may want to drop in. They do welcome visitors. They ask that you call ahead of time, but they really do, uh, do like to see people. In, in their, <laughs> you know, that was not intended. This is the uh, director of the library. This is Helen Fisher in the yellow there. This photo was taken last year on the 25th anniversary of the American Nudist Research Library. This next photo was at the Ig Nobel ceremony. Helen Fisher's daughter came and accepted the prize. And as you can see, she gave a wonderful speech that went on a little bit too long. And Miss Sweetie Pooh let her know. <laughs> this is a membership application you're looking at for the library. It's very simple to become a member. And of course, it's a pleasure to use the library. The Ig Nobel Psychology Prize was awarded to Dan Simons of the University of Illinois 
and Chris Chabri of Harvard University for demonstrating that when people pay close attention to something, it's all too easy to overlook anything else, even a woman in a gorilla suit. Now, if you're watching the webcast of this, you probably are a little mystified because you didn't see the video, but everyone here saw the video, except for the people who missed part of the video when they were watching it. But uh, it's available up on their website. It's a beautiful scientific experiment, beautiful in the sense that it's one of the few scientific experiments you can look at and you understand immediately, and it tells you something that you're going to remember. Their website has the demonstration up there. So you can go watch this yourself. You can show it to other people. Um, the website, I don't remember offhand. You can get to it from our website, from improbable.com. You can see a lot of the uh, original research from a lot of the Ig Nobel winners and a link to Dan Simons' website. This is the beginning of their published report about it. This is their academic report. And they gave it the lovely title, Gorillas in Our Midst. Here are the two co-winners at the Ig Nobel ceremony delivering their speech. You can see they're both very somber people. And here they are showing the video to the crowd at Sanders Theater. And this is a still from the video. The Ig Nobel Economics Prize was awarded to the Vatican <laughs> for outsourcing prayers to <laughs> India. Is there anyone here who's not familiar with this achievement? Okay. Um, to give it to you in a nutshell, the Catholic Church saw a, a difficulty, which is common to many churches, and they came up with a practical solution. And the difficulty was in many countries, the United States is one of them, there's a long tradition of people asking that prayers be said on behalf of generally a loved one, and they'll go into a church, pay a small amount of money, and a priest will say the prayer. But in recent years, in many places, there is a shortage of priests. There just are not enough priests to keep up with the demand. However, in parts of India, there is a surplus of priests who don't have a whole lot to do, and many of whom don't have a lot of money. So it was organized that when this happens, uh, the system simply compensates. This is the Vatican, and this is India. The Ig Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to Daisuke Inoue of Hyogo, Japan, for inventing karaoke, <laughs> thereby providing an entirely new way for people to learn to tolerate each other. This is Mr. Inoue at the Ig Nobel Prize ceremony. It was his first trip to the United States. He invented karaoke about 35 years ago. And by his description, he was at that time a lazy drummer for a very bad rock band. They frequently played in a club where businessmen would come at night, sing with the band, and one day they somehow managed to double book themselves. They were supposed to be playing in two places at once. So they, Mr. Inoue, made a tape recording of the band playing the music and somehow talked a businessman into taking the tape and playing it and singing to the tape recording, and that was the birth of karaoke. He later uh, Mr. Inouye later put it into a box and so formalized it. But he never made a huge amount of money off this. And he generally didn't get a lot of recognition until he won his Ig Nobel Prize. Uh, here he is. He doesn't speak much English, but he gave a terrific speech. And when he was finished with his speech, he was about to sit down. And then we had a surprise for him. We had several Nobel laureates sing him a karaoke tribute. <laughs> and... What they sang was that nice song from the 60s. You're just too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off of you. This, too, you can see. If you go to our website and look at the video from the, uh, from the whole ceremony, you can see this magical moment. I think magical is the right word here in history. And uh, we had... We keep the Ig Nobel winners strictly secret until the ceremony occurs, but we thought this was something special, and... We also came to realize in doing our research that even in Japan, most people did not know that there is a single inventor of karaoke. So we got in touch with a couple of the Japanese TV networks, and they scrambled. They moved heaven and earth to come over with cameras and crew. And uh, the moment the ceremony was over, they latched on to him. 
And finally, the tenth prize, the final prize we announced at the ceremony, was the Ig Nobel Biology Prize. It was awarded to two teams of scientists, one of them based in Canada and Scotland, the other based in Sweden and Denmark. They did this research independently of each other, but at roughly the same time and discovered roughly the same thing. They won the Ig Nobel Biology Prize for showing that herrings apparently <laughs> communicate by <laughs> farting. <laughs> this is the research paper produced by one of the teams. This is the paper produced by the other. They never met up, these two groups of people, until the night of the Ig Nobel Prize ceremony. <laughs> Here they are, they came from Sweden, from Canada, from Scotland. And here they are some more. <laughs> if you remind me in a couple of minutes, I have a brief recording of what it sounds like but you'll have to remind me. Before that, I'll show you just a few pictures of other things that happen at Ig Nobel ceremonies. At the end of the ceremony, we usually ask all of the winners and all the Nobel laureates and everybody else who's up there on stage to gather at the middle of the stage for a pointless photo opportunity. That's what you're looking at here. And we have some other things. Just to mention a very few, every year we have a win a date with a Nobel laureate contest. <laughs> Each of the 1,200 people who buys a ticket and comes to the ceremony has a chance to win a date. What you're seeing here is Professor Lipscomb. You saw him before, William Lipscomb, Nobel laureate in chemistry. He's scouring the audience, waiting to see who is going to win a date with him. Uh, by the way, Professor Lipscomb is 85 years old. <laughs> and here in this next picture, you'll see the winner claiming her prize. <laughs> Every year we also include a little opera, a mini opera, we usually call it. We write these every year. They're about some topic in science and they're performed by Nobel laureates and professional opera singers. This year's opera was the Atkins Diet Opera. Here are a couple of pictures from it. That's Dr. Atkins and I won't even begin to try to explain what this is about, but if you go and look at the video, you'll get some idea. And uh, at the end of the opera this year, we had a kick line and we persuaded somehow the winners and the Nobel laureates to join in. And they were quite, um, they were quite. <laughs> a couple of days later, because we have only allowed each of the winners about one minute to give an acceptance speech, and because all of them have stories that people really will want to hear much more about, we invite them to stick around for two more days. And the ceremony is on a Thursday night on Saturday afternoon at MIT, which is just a couple miles down the road from Harvard. We have an afternoon of free public lectures. These are the IG informal lectures. And each of the winners gets to tell in some detail and even demonstrate what they've done and why they did it, if they're capable of explaining that. And as you can see, the audience gets very wrapped up in this. <laughs> and here, very briefly, is, is just a quick, quick look at a handful of the people who've won. Keep in mind that there are now about 140 prizes that have been awarded over the years. So this is just a few of them. Several years ago, the Ig Nobel Physics Prize was awarded to Arndt Leica, who is a professor of physics in Germany, and he won the Physics Prize for demonstrating that beer bubbles obey the mathematical law of logarithmic decay. The Ig Nobel Peace Prize a couple years ago was awarded to a man named Lal Bihari, who lives in India. He won the Peace Prize because he is the founder and president of the Association of Dead People. <laughs> Are there any members here tonight of the association? Are anybody here familiar with it? I'm sure there is. Anybody like to explain briefly to everybody else what it is? I guess not. All right. Very briefly, in case you haven't run into this, in parts of India, there's a problem that's been around for a long time. It's not well known outside the country. If you own something valuable, a house, land, money, whatever, and you have relatives who don't like you and are greedy, 
they can go and pay a very small bribe to a government official and have you declared legally dead. <laughs> and when that happens, in effect, you're dead. That happened to Lal Bihari. His relatives did this to him. He lost all his possessions. He had no place to live, couldn't get a job. No one would talk to him. Didn't know what to do for several years. And then he started to notice in asking around that he wasn't alone, that in his province, he says, in just his province alone, there are more than 10,000 of these living dead people. <laughs> so it's a big problem. And he finally came up with a method that he thought might help a little. He started to gather people. They formed the Association of Dead People, and they began to hold very loud public rallies in front of the government offices. This is one that you see here. This is an official rally of the Association of Dead People. That's Lal Bihari in the black in the middle there. And it started to have an effect. Several of these people are literally getting their lives back. So if you can help to spread the word, you'll be doing something very good for the world and certainly for these people. Uh, this is a technical drawing from a research paper that was awarded the Ig Nobel Physics Prize a few years ago. Well, technically speaking, the, the seven scientists who wrote it were awarded the prize. They're all in Australia. And the title of their research project was an analysis of the forces required to drag sheep over various surfaces. <laughs> what you're looking at here is a force diagram of the forces acting on the sheep as it's being dragged over various surfaces. And here are a couple of photographs from the technical report. This won the Ig Nobel Literature Prize a few years ago. It's a report called The Effects of Pre-Existing Inappropriate Highlighting on Reading Comprehension. <laughs> what you're looking at here is a lovely pastoral scene. Two years ago, the Ig Nobel Economics Prize was awarded jointly to a man named Carl Schwarzler and to the nation of Liechtenstein. They won the economics prize for making it possible for anyone to rent the entire country of Liechtenstein <laughs> for weddings, bar mitzvahs, and corporate parties. <laughs> this is a photograph of Liechtenstein. <laughs> and this is the famous Blonsky device. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. This is a technical drawing again. This is from the patent that was granted to George and Charlotte Blonsky in 1965. At that time, they were living in New York City. They're a married couple. They designed this device, which they describe as a device to assist women in giving birth. This device consists of a large round table and some machinery. When the woman is about ready to give birth to her child, she lies down on her back on the table. She's strapped down to the table, and the table is then rotated at high speed. <laughs> That's a really quick look at the Ig Nobel Prizes. I, I do want to urge you, those of you here, those of you watching on TV, if you run across somebody or something that deserves an Ig Nobel Prize, it has that quality, it makes you laugh and makes you think, please get in touch with us. We, we, we crave more nominations, even though we have more than we can possibly handle. Some things are just so good, they're never going to get recognition from the world any other way. And I'm sorry that it, it comes down to this, but at least it's something. Uh, I was going to show you, or not show you, I was going to play for you the sound of the herring. <laughs> Anyone who wants to leave the room, of course, this is an appropriate time. All right, here it is. It's brief. This, again, is uh, the sound recorded. Uh, this was recorded by the Canadian and Scottish team. This is the herring communicating. I would like to ask our sign language interpreter, <laughs> what was going through your mind in deciding how to interpret this?
The interpreter is now asking me if I am asking the interpreter. <laughs> and I'm sure she's interpreting that question. And I'll let you off the hook. I apologize for putting you through that. I'll, as a way of easing your and my embarrassment, I will play the sound one more time. <laughs> Um, I'll give you just a couple more things to look at and think about. I am also the editor of a magazine called The Annals of Improbable Research, which is a real magazine. It's on paper. Most people believe it doesn't exist. It does. It comes out six times a year. And it, like the Ig Nobel Prizes, is all about research and other things that first make people laugh and then make people think. Now, Everything in the world is, is uh, good for us to cover. I'm going to show you just two things, and these are projects that we ourselves started. One is something called Project Kappa. We've been doing this for several months. Project Kappa is our attempt to collect scientists' rituals for preparing tea and preparing coffee. And our project has two parts, Project, <clears throat> excuse me, project Kappa Tea and Project Kappa Coffee. <laughs> And scientists around the world have been very good about sending in lots and lots of rituals, especially scientists in Britain, for some reason, uh, and in India and in China. And, and many of them are quite insistent that their ritual is the proper one. However, at least in Britain, most of them are not correct because in the United Kingdom, there is an official standard for how to prepare a cup of tea. This is it. This is the beginning of it anyway. It's published by the British Standards Organization. It's six pages long. And it was awarded the Ig Nobel Literature Prize back in, I believe, 1999. Now, here is just one ritual. This is how one particular scientist makes tea. And this is Professor William Lipscomb, who you've seen just a little bit. Again, he's a chemist. First says, <coughs> excuse me, first says Professor Lipscomb, get some water, and I'm going to do that <laughs> just so I can talk. Thank you to whoever provided the water. <laughs> I expect Monica gave a lot of thought to, Monica, would you take a bow? Thank you for... <laughs> All right, this is Professor Lipscomb's method for making a cup of tea. First, he says, get some water. <laughs> you may prefer an alternative method. <laughs> then, heat the water. <laughs> you may prefer an alternative method. Pour the hot water into the teapot. Then select the tea and place the tea into the teapot. Then prepare the milk. Make sure the milk is fresh. <laughs> pour the milk into the cup. Then pour the hot tea into the cup. Then check the temperature. If the tea is too hot, <laughs> let it cool. You may prefer an alternative method. To cool tea, place it in the freezer for an appropriate length of time. When the tea is ready, take a sip. And then enjoy. <laughs> Professor Lipscomb. And let's see, I'll show you, I know, I'll show you two more things. One is a project and then the other is something rather special. Another Ig Nobel Prize winner. These are both pretty brief. The project I'll show you is the LF HCFS, which was founded in, I believe, the year 2001. It's a project we started. It's called the Luxuriant Flowing Hair Club for Scientists. <laughs> to join the Luxuriant Flowing Hair Club for Scientists, you need two things. One is you need to be a scientist, and you need to have luxuriant flowing hair. Let me read you this quotation from a scientific uh, book. Luxuriant hair is always pleasing, possibly because it shows not only current health, but a record of health in the years before. That was written by Steven Pinker, the eminent psychologist. Dr. Pinker is a member of the Luxuriant <laughs> Flowing Hair Club for Scientists. 
Here's another quote. This was on the application form that somebody else sent in to join the LFHCFS. She wrote, I just spent over five weeks in a tent in Antarctica, and boy, was my hair a mess after no showers. This is Dr. Diane DeMassa, who's a professor of marine engineering. Dr. DeMassa is a member. <laughs> this was sent in on an application form which read, I am a chemical researcher in an Italian company, besides being a guitarist in an heavy metal band. This is Dr. Piero Paravadino, who listed himself as a chemist and rock star. <laughs> and Dr. Paravadino was chosen as a man of the year for the LFHCFS. The application from the three Bobro sisters, who are biologists and engineers, told us that between the three of them, they have more than seven feet of hair. The Bobro sisters collectively were chosen as the club's women of the year this year. And finally, this application said, we are chemists, colleagues, and friends. This is three chemists from Germany, and they too were chosen as the hair club's men of the year. They are the reigning men of the year, in fact. And although I probably don't have to bother saying it, if you are a scientist and you do have luxuriant flowing hair and you would like to join the club, and thus be up on the club's website, which is part of our website at improbable.com. You can see all of the club members, and better, you can see their hair up there. If you'd like to join, just get in touch with us. And this is not strictly related, <laughs> but it's sort of related. Dr. Karen Hopkin, who is a biochemist and a co-author of one of the leading textbooks on cell biology, has a project that she started by herself a number of years ago, and she's probably best known in the science world for that project. It's called the Stud Muffins of Science Calendar. Dr. Hopkin, at her own great expense and, and labor, gathered stud muffins from around the world. She produced this calendar. It's a real calendar. It has 12 months. Each of them has a photograph of a PhD scientist. Uh, what you're looking at here is Dr. December. <laughs> And if anyone would like to get in touch with Dr. Hopkin about the calendar, just talk to me afterwards or go to our website. So that's a little bit about the uh, hair club. And before I end and, and take questions, I thought maybe I'll show you just uh, another little piece of video. Um, let's see, I'm going to take the sound out of this because it may be better without the sound. This is brief. I'll just tell you in advance what it is so you'll have some way of trying to put this in context. It's a man named Troy. Hurtabies. Troy gave us permission to, to show this piece of film I'm about to show you. Troy Hurtabies lives in a small town in northern Ontario, Canada. He spent about seven years personally designing, building, and testing a suit of armor that he hopes will protect him against grizzly bears. And realizing how powerful and potent grizzly bears are, he spent all of that time doing a graded series of tests, smaller forces and then larger forces and larger and larger. And I think the video here speaks for itself. That last test involved a truck traveling, I believe, at about 50 kilometers per hour. 
And Troy says that they did that test 18 times. <laughs> Had you come to the 1998 Ig Nobel Prize ceremony, you could have met Troy and touched the suit and tested it yourself had you wanted to. And Troy came back the next year, uh, following up on our invitation to winners to come back. And he proved very, very popular with the crowd. Troy is quite an individual. Uh, <laughs> let me say one other thing about Troy, or, or two things. One is this film and a bunch of others were collected and made into a documentary by the National Film Board of Canada. You can go rent it or buy it. It's called Project Grizzly. It was never really shown much in theaters here. <laughs> Um, <laughs> now I've forgotten what else I was, oh yes, about Troy. I think it's important to say this. No matter what you may think of Troy's decision to begin doing this work and then to continue doing it for seven years, <laughs> no matter what you may think of that, and I realize a number of people think Troy is just nuts, and Troy realizes that, something to keep in mind, Troy is still alive. <laughs> There are very few people anywhere who are that careful to go through all that and still be in good shape. And I think that's an important part of what won Troy his Ig Nobel Prize. Now, those are the things I brought to show you. Uh, I'm going to stick around for a bit and uh, see, answer some questions. Oh, and, and remind me at the end of the questions, I brought a few copies of the magazine and some Ig Nobel posters so if anybody wants one, just come on down afterwards. Um, some of you in the other room will see about finding a way to get you some of these. Uh, we've got a few magazines, a few posters. Now, um, if anybody has any questions, fire away uh, at, at the lovely Dasani <laughs> purchaser who's wielding the microphone. Yes, I'd like you to go into detail about Dasani. Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, you'd like me to go into yes, detail? Yes, no. <laughs> You're the man with the bottle. Right. Wait, you'd only like me to do it because I'm the man with the bottle, you're saying? Right. Dasani was introduced in England, and it was the Coca-Cola Company of Great Britain that won the prize. And a year or two ago, two things came out in the news in fairly rapid succession. First was that Dasani was being promoted heavily as a really, really good kind of water, worth paying a lot of money for. And they were charging good prices for it and marketing it heavily. And as you can see, the wonderful design on the bottle. And then it came out that they were getting their water from the water tap, <laughs> from the, the main water supply. Um, the public got a little upset about that. And the, the ruckus was just beginning to die down when it came out that the Coca-Cola company had been putting small amounts of various chemicals into Dasani to enhance the taste. And one of those chemicals had been reacting once it got in the water. And the result of the reaction was it formed a substance that's known to be highly carcinogenic. And so when that became known, the company almost immediately pulled it off the market. So that's the story of Dasani. However, it's still being sold in this country. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question, please. We've handed our tickets in, but I noticed on the ticket there's a picture of you with some marsupial. What is that? I haven't seen the tickets. Uh, <laughs> I'll take a guess. Something? Me with kangaroo? four kangaroos, perhaps. One. With one kangaroo. Oh, you didn't see the right picture then. So I don't know what to say. Uh, that was taken last year, that photograph. The, um, the Ig Nobel phenomenon, I guess you call it at this point, seems to have been growing and growing and spreading around the world. And the last few years, see, three years running now, every spring, We've gone over to the, to the UK for National Science Week. The UK has a National Science Week in March where they have scientists come out of their holes and do things in public so that the public can get to see scientists and, and get involved and, and realize that science is generally a pretty interesting thing. And they've had us come over and we invite a whole bunch of Ig Nobel Prize winners to come and some musicians and all sorts of things. And we've done a whole series of live shows around the country which has been a lot of fun to do, and, and the public seems to like it a lot. And last year, 
in Australia for Australia's National Science Week, we were invited to come and do the same thing. And that picture was taken in Australia. In fact, it was taken in Tasmania, which is a wonderful place that we hope to get back to. So thank, thanks for the question. How many times did the white-shirted team pass the <laughs> basketball? You know, I haven't the slightest idea. <laughs> you have another question. Or is it a complaint? <laughs> no, I, I noticed that there was an absence of these people, so I'm wondering, is the United States Congress ineligible for uh, <laughs> No one is ineligible for an Ig Nobel Prize. Let me make a statement of sorts. It will be, perhaps some of you will take it as a comment. It's not meant that way. It's a simple fact. But there's a lot of competition for these Ig Nobel Prizes now. Okay, next question. Microphone is wending its way over there. I, did uh, Coca-Cola show up to uh, accept their prize? No, we, um, we tried. We couldn't find the right person in the Coca-Cola company. And we are hopeful that at some point in the future, somebody from Coca-Cola will come and accept the prize. Now, it's, it's um, maybe of interest to some people that a number of years ago, 10 years ago, in fact, I think, uh, the uh, Pepsi Cola Company of the Philippines was awarded the Ig Nobel Prize uh, in the field of peace, the Ig Nobel Peace Prize. And the, the Coca-Cola, excuse me, the, the Pepsi Cola Company of the Philippines won because they had, they had carried out a contest in which one bottle had a number stamped under the cap. And if you won the bottle that had that particular number stamped in it, you would win a million Philippine dollars. And this was a wildly successful promotion. People went all over the place buying lots and lots of cases of Pepsi Cola. And then some kind of mistake was made and the wrong number was announced. So suddenly something like 10,000 people <laughs> were legally <laughs> entitled to each claim a million dollars. And the company I think at this point they probably would say they could have handled it better. <laughs> uh, it set off riots, there were a number of deaths, and they were, the good part is that they were awarded the Ig Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> Next question. Oh, yep. Would you like some water to tonight? keep you going? <laughs> I'm sorry, who had their hand up? What? When are the actual awards made? The ceremony happens usually on the first Thursday night in October. Occasionally somebody else grabs the theater. Uh, hard to think that there are people at Harvard who have more clout than we do, but so we move it a week ahead of, or a week back. This year it will be on Thursday night, October 6th, 2005. The tickets will go on sale in August from the Harvard box office in Holyoke Center. I hope you'll come. If you can't, watch it on the internet. Okay, well, thank you very much, Monica. Thank you to the museum, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>